Good day, folks. Just an update on the process. I'd say so far I'm about maybe 10 to 15 percent into it. I'm still missing a bunch of parts and tuning equipment. And that's all in the works. But for now, just trying to eyeball things as much as I can and test some interactions and theories which I had in mind. And so far, we're actually doing some very great progress. So more on this device here that I showed earlier. So essentially what I have here for a test that I wanted to confirm something here is I have my very small neon transformer here, but very toy uh, plasma ball. This is where it came out of, which is driven by a few volts here by this AC to DC adapter, very low current. So no tricks here. So this is one wire output, which goes into the... So what I want to get here first, you might be wondering why the fluorescent tube and the foil and all that. Well, I've noticed that Don Smith, remember, um, especially his suitcase device and what he showcased, he talks about a ground a lot, right, for the capacitor displacement current, and that's valid, you know, because you create a potential difference from the ground and then you can continuously short the capacitor to reload, right? But a lot of people don't have ground, yet Don Smith seemed to have figured out a way to make it work without an earth ground, even though an earth ground is preferable, you can make this work without an earth ground. So, trying to uh, think about it, I figured out the best way to do that is obviously, right, folks, if you want to run your load, like let's say he had a lamp, like this would be a load here, which would normally go from the output of this and then the ground side, and this would run our load, right? But if we don't have ground, how can we loop this, right? So, the whole idea to create essentially power is you need a potential difference, right? So it's pretty easy to create a potential difference with the E-field when you have like the fluorescent being excited and ionized and you have the foil wrapping like I do here, which creates a capacitive plate. Now, it will be a potential, but not the same as essentially direct, right? So essentially by what I'm getting at is I feed the high voltage one side of the into the tube here, fluorescent. The other side goes out here and then feeds the prime, well, which would be the primary side, which is the inside coil here. Then the output of this here goes into our load. But since we don't have ground, right, to create that gradient or potential difference, we simply tap off the capacitor plate nearby, which we're also loading, but it has. So that potential difference, so essentially you could actually fine tune the system in a way where if you only need 100 volts or whatever, just create it out of the potential difference and your load will run without the ground and do the same thing, right? So now part two was another thing which I talked about was the RF choke filter over here, very important. So watch my earlier videos if you want to find out more about this. This is something I noticed in the corner of my eye from one of the Don Smith suitcase devices. Doesn't talk much about it, but there it is hanging around right there. Being a ham operator, I recognize this right away. So to test a the theory here, I have the secondary output, which is the um, like air core, like Don Smith does, which is uh, the step-up transformer. The output is here, go into this high-frequency full-bridge rectifier here. And the output of this basically goes to this tube spark gap. But I'm sending it in series on this side here, this coil here, which is our RF choke. So what happens here is we filter out the grading and high frequencies from the spark gap as it's creating all this. So what I'm getting at is I'm missing a lot of equipment and then you, you can basically fine tune all of this, but without knowing, I've got to use the hard hammer approach. So basically with the spark gap, you're saturating with all the known frequencies. So it will basically find its own frequency, but gives you that rich environment to interact with. So the RF choke takes all those high frequency fluctuations and that's loop here. This is the E-field fluctuating around randomly, blah, 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 blah. And then you get your magnetic field that propagates around this. This is usually wasted here. And then we're decoupling that. This here basically acts as a resonant tuned magnetic coupling, which can then be rectified and sent back to a battery or loop. In this example, I had to connect it to the scope because I want to show you folks what happens and how rich the environment is. And it's basically like the Bedini method, but on steroids. You get those, those spikes, but they are like crazy. I will show you, okay? So we will turn this on here. So I'm just going to plug this in here. Little transformer, like I said here, nothing much to it. We turn this on. So as you can see, it's driving the fluorescent tube. 
Here is our load, nice, big, powerful, bright load. As you see, because I'm creating the gradient and the potential difference locally, I don't need the ground at all. Now, Don Smith never specified how he actually did this. So method to the madness, folks, method to the madness. And our spark gap on the rectified side from our secondary here is running out here. I don't know if you can see the spark gap in there. There it is. To the gas discharge tube, this is a one kilovolt discharge tube. And we've got the scope connected on this side and look at all of those random, look at that, 460 volts, all those nice spikes ready to be rectified and charged. And what's very interesting is if I were to, which I'm going to show you in a second, hook up a rectifier to this, charge and discharge the capacitor continuously, it doesn't affect our load out here. The E and the um, H fields basically are completely separate systems in this configuration. So the load doesn't experience the charging going on over here. I can discharge the capacitor and you'd expect to drop for a moment, a blink while the system tries to recharge, right? But because it's completely decoupled, nothing happens. But the capacitor reach, it's completely independent. So just think about what you can do with that concept, right? So I'm gonna show you the next thing, but I just wanted to show you, but I'll show you that this is actually because of the spark gap. We're gonna bypass, okay? So as you see, we don't need the spark gap to run this, but we're trying to get an additional system for free. So I could disconnect this, and as you see, doesn't do any, I say I disconnected it, but didn't do anything to the load. But look over here now. Poof, nothing. Basically just random, very, very slow noise because there's always minimal fluctuations. I'll bypass it and short it direct. So now we're shorting out the rectifier direct. Still nothing with the lamp. Our main load still doesn't see it because it's this system here feeding it. But boo, right? Nothing fancy out here no more. We add the spark gap back. And all of a sudden, we get all of this for free again. Ready to charge your running battery or whatever, right? And our load runs nice over here. 110 volts AC load, our lamp. And with this method, with the capacitive coupling, as long as you have a potential difference between the two sources, that's how you get your current. So you could basically engineer it to whatever you want, like Don Smith was doing. But again, I haven't went into any advanced, you know, the transducers, the inverters. The, this is very basic, right? This won't run your computer, your TV, your fridge or anything like that, right? So there's still a whole... Plus, this is, like, like I said, the hard hammer approach. I'd like to get my equipment soon so I could actually find the resonant points and feed it with frequency generators at that frequency. So the whole idea is we don't want the spark gap because it's, it, it, it's a spark gap is minimum hours and there's noise and heat and everything. So you don't need all of that if you don't need it, right? But the test for now, it's, it's a good, like I said, it's the hard hammer approach to confirm what Don Smith was doing was worthwhile. So with that said, let's move on to the table here. I just want to disconnect this. Okay. I want to show you another kind of interaction over here. Now. So here we have something similar, but different. The load over here. Still in the work, some of it is not, and again, I'm still missing capacitors and everything because I want to use something like this to trigger my capacitors, which I then build the coils for the displacement current effect, which I was talking about in earlier videos, but I'm working basically on the driver stage for, for now anyways, and then later on. But before, what was bad with, with my experiments is I had a bad habit of dismantling every experiment to use the parts because of resources. So now what I'm doing, like Bedini, is every attempt, every module, whatever, I leave alone and then move on and then experiment with it because later on it might be applicable to plug it all in together to make everything work. So that's the goal from this point on. So if you're all wondering why, I've got all these modules all of a sudden. 
So essentially here, a little bit of a different approach. This is a, my neon transformer, which generally speaking wants 220 volts, 35 watts. I don't want to do that, right? Because I want to use a pure potential. And, I, and again, people over here are saying, well, you're driving it with the mains, right? And people always say, come up with things. Oh, the extra energy is coupling capacitively, or they come up with crazy things. I've seen it all in my comments, right? So to content everyone, you know, here, this version is decoupled. To observe, see, I first look, and if I'm happy, I try it over here with, and confirm that, you know, no, it's not the mains. So this 5 volts, just a very basic, powers this tiny inverter, which in turn runs this one here, which powers this um, full bridge voltage. Um, it's a, actually a voltage times 4 multiplier, believe it or not. But what we do is we feed one side into this fluorescent tube here. And what I got here essentially is very intense filtering. So this coil here acts as the primary filtering. It goes through the loop, say, on the DC side here. And here on the AC side, we got this one here, which is also like the secondary filtering, which powers this tube here. And the output loops back on the other side of our AC loop here. And this is essentially the same idea, RF choking and fine tuning uh, with variable capacitor, but I'm not there yet. I don't have the parts to really make this piece work. Same thing with here. This is another variable system like a radio antenna coil. This in hope is what I'm gonna use to charge my capacitors, another rectifier, which I still don't have. But to show the effect here, what I've done here is this is the final filtering, which is a very complex um, low pass, high pass filtering network, uh, capacitive resistance and coils, obviously, and various points. And it actually has variable capacitors, so I can actually fine tune it, and various output ports for various frequency ranges, V and C output. So what I'm doing to show what we saw earlier with all the random spikes, this is here the equivalent where you'd get them, right? And what I'm doing is I'm taking the output because we're converting that back into a regular electric field into this rectifier charging this capacitor to show you indeed we can charge this and it charges pretty, for what it is, pretty fast. And this could be your battery or whatever. So this is the output we were seeing with the spikes. The equivalent on here anyways, but I want to show you that, yes, indeed, we can capture this energy and I will short it out and show you that it doesn't affect our load like you think it would be if it'd be a linear, regular kind of power coupling, right? And this is the field meter. I'll show you how intense. By the way, this plasma tube, well, not plasma, but um, neon, sorry, neon, is special because... It's a USSR tube, it's an actual noise generator, so it actually emits a very strong uh, magnetic field of its own, which of course this one picks up and loops. Over. Anyways, um, again, this is a lot in the works, but I'm gonna show you it now. So we turn this on, so this is what we get, right? So there's our load, and Let's try and get the magnetic field here in U Teslas. And as I get really close, I'm going to find in here. There it is with the choke, right? That's doing its thing. So this is not optimal. It's just to show you a demonstration, right? And um, let's go with the magnetic. This is the electric field right here. It's off the scale, actually. So this this thing is generating very strong. So there's a lot of room for, what this means is there's a lot of room for additional capacitive plate style coupling around here, which I haven't even utilized or introduced yet. But look what's happening here. 28 volts DC now on our rectifier here, just from the output of the filtering, which comes in for free. So I'm going to short this out, pay attention to the load here. I'm going to short it out. It's hard to show both at the same time. Can I do this? Um, oh, do we have it here? I want to show you both at the same time. There we go, see? I shorted it and didn't do nothing to the load. 
And now the capacitor is already uh, recharging itself back up very quickly, by the way. And in a moment, I'll short it out and show you the spark. But the point is, again, right, the two systems are completely decoupled. Your load runs and your E field and your H field is what drives the RF choke. And you can rectify that and get energy out of it right here. So we're back to 23, 24 volts. So I'm going to show you that spark that John liked to show everyone. I don't know if you saw that, but there it was. And this meter's off the scale. And this is a, a noise generator. So this is actually an, part of why my field is off the scale here. So um, if you'd have Wi-Fi around here, it wouldn't work very well. <laughs> okay. So I just want to show everyone this. And again, look, it's only this. And this is what, like 1.5 amps max. And it's nowhere running at 1.5 amps. It's not even warm. I know this, very little wires, very tiny inverter. This is my way of limiting the input. Because if we were, you know, we're talking all this time, this thing would have went warm, right? And I mean, everything's working fine. So, um, with that said, just progress, progress, folks. But I really want to, this is nowhere near where I wanted, but I'm just confirming exactly where I thought Don Smith was with this stuff. And we'll take it from there. And until next time, and thank you for watching.